You have stumbled into a zombie takeout, Philip Gaston. Now, whether you like it or not, you are lost in it with the rest of us. Hello and welcome to episode 419 of Zombie Takeout, the B-Movie and Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And uh, before we get to this week's movie, we've got a voicemail from Bodo. John, Scotto, Bodo here. I've been a bad friend. Scotto, I knew about that storm that hit you up there in Chicago. I checked with everybody else because the same storm hit my girl in Ames. She was out with, without power for two days, and I knew you guys got affected, and I forgot to check to see you're okay. I'm glad to see you're okay. John, I'm sorry that uh, I did not check with you about the hurricane. I forgot where you were at, too. Anyway, uh, let's go back in time a little bit. Life Force, or as I call it, Vampires in Space. Uh, not a bad movie. Uh, the nine minutes of exposure was worth it. Uh, Patrick Stewart, better than this or Dune? Hmm, tough choice. Anyway, I agree with you guys. It's worth about a four, four and a half. Now, this Reign of Fire. I thought you said Ring of Fire, so I went down three-hour time suck with Johnny Cash music, especially in horror movies. It was worth it. Hell a lot worth it than paying for this Reign of Fire again. I had forgot I had paid for it to go see it in the movie theater. I was mad then. I paid another three ninety nine. I'm mad again. This movie I did not care about any of the people, any of the dragons, any of the backstory, any of the history, any of the athletic characters, any of the men, women, children, dragons, deer, birds, this whole world did not care. This movie made me not care. They didn't make me care. It was horrible. This is the first movie in the history of the show. This long many years that I've been around. I've given it zero brains. Gosh. I hope I never get suckered in watching this kid. Anyway, you guys are the best. Love you guys. Keep up the great work. Peace out. Um, no worries about forgetting where I'm at, but, uh, it's not like I announce it almost every time I introduce myself, uh, at the beginning of a show. Do you? No, I'm, uh, I'm kind of fucking with you. Oh. <laughs> um, so yeah, no worries about that. Um, and... I was thinking of making that my thing and then I decided not to. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> I, I kind of felt we're making that joke cause you didn't do it this week. Um, now, um, Patrick Stewart. As far as performances, I'm gonna go with Dune because he's in more of it. Um, but he, I don't, he was not right for Gurney Halleck, so I think he no, fit. No, not at all. No, I think he fit Life Force better. Um, the Johnny Cash time suck sounds good. Um, it's certainly better <laughs> than Ring of Fire, and even I liked it a lot more than you did. Um, <laughs> so of the three of us, you liked it the most. That's weird. I did, and uh, you see, we should have went with the Johnny Cash reference uh, for yeah, the title. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Scott had a Johnny Cash reference for a title all that week. Um, yeah. All right, but I also had a um, some tweets um, at, at Zombie Takeout. Um, how did you, how did the dragons multiply? Were they born pregnant? Um, you mentioned they killed off the dinosaurs. Man, like the man said, nature will find a way. Um, and I think they established that the male dragon flies around the world and fertilizes all the eggs. He's That's busy. why they had to kill the male. He's kind of like James Brown at the end of the show where they had to put the cape back on him. Right, right. He's yeah. ready to just collapse. Right. Um, and he also tweeted, um, Lady Hawk, I made it 20 minutes in and could not stand anymore. Hope you guys enjoyed it better. <laughs> and one more thing before we get to the movie. In the outtake that well, we both saw Bill and Ted face the music over the weekend, uh, so we'll be discussing that in the outtake. If you haven't seen it, stop after, you know, there you are, or if you want to hear that last little bit of Yoko Kata, <laughs> but stop there if you haven't seen Bill and Ted and you have any interest in seeing it, because you do want to go into this, you know, without knowing much. 
All right, on to this week's movie, which is from 1985, Lady Hawk, continuing our fantasy trilogy. And of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by Internal Monologues. There's a reason they're internal, and they should probably stay that way. And also brought to you by Soundtracks. What works for an aerobics video should not be used for a fantasy action movie. I knew that music sounded familiar. I just couldn't place it until I heard that. Well, you see, it was was in the style of, I felt. I think they were trying to go for an Errol Flynn, you know, pastiche, but instead, it, it was actually Alan Parsons that did it, too. Well, no, he, he, I think he was the music director. The composer was, I want to say Andrew Powell, someone who's oh, collaborated yeah. with Parsons quite a bit, worked, with, worked, a lot, worked on a lot of Parsons project stuff. So because they spent all that money... They were just blasting this soundtrack, whether yeah. it fit the mood or not. <laughs> it never fit the mood. <laughs> no, it didn't. But anyway, we have a uh, we have a thief who is uh, making his great escape. Uh, no one ever escaped from Stalag Thirteen or this mm-hmm. uh, or whatever this town ran by this bishop Aquila, Aqu- my friend Aquila. Aquila, they call it. Um, which apparently is a Latin for eagle. My one bit of trivia, and this caught my attention because there's a brand of ukulele string is spelled the same way, A Q U I L A, and I've heard Aquila, Aquila. Yeah, you know, I've heard a billion pronunciations for that word. Well, I saw the Archbishop sitting on a park bench, and he was he was mm. eyeing girls yeah. with bad intent. They say anyway. it a lot like Aqualung in the movie for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> that's who should have been doing the fucking soundtrack to this oh, you God, get yes. other fucking ian anderson and that's it <laughs> oh this would be i don't care what happened in the movie if this was a tall soundtrack it would be a, 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 at least a four and a half yeah uh <laughs> you just so gave anyway, me an idea for sequels and remakes um yeah there you go uh we have uh we have this thief who is making his escape and uh he well, spoiler alert, he is successful. <laughs> he uh, he does the impossible and gets out of the, through through the sewer system, makes his way out. And uh, as he's out on the countryside, he's uh, he gets caught because he's, I mean, they mm-hmm. were really looking for him and right. want to make an example of him. Uh, but however, he has the good fortune of running into... Uh, I guess a bigger felon in the uh, <laughs> world of the town, a former captain of the guard, um, played by Rutger Hauer, of course, and um, he uh, decides to save uh, this thief who is uh, escaped, who is escaped, and they were going to bring back, and uh, winds up killing a bunch of uh, guards and, and sending them on their way. Well, now he doesn't send the ones he killed on their way. Yeah, chase them off or whatever. Yeah. Uh, they has first. I'm wondering, like, well, why is he going back to the town when he doesn't have any success? The captain of the guard to tell you know the bishop what mm. was going on, and then it was realized it was oh, this is a much bigger problem than yeah. just the stupid thief. This I dude kinda, is back. I kind of wondered why they were expending all of this energy on a random thief, and then apparently this this prison has this reputation that nobody has escaped it. Right, so he is, you know, Archbishop Colonel Clink, and, uh, you know, this is uh, Hogan's Heroes. <laughs> but anyway, um, so the thief is traveling with this swordsman who is, I guess, outlaw, you know, former guard captain himself. Uh, but he's got this uh, hawk that's with him. Uh, keep thinking of the falconer from saturday Night live mm. <laughs> and i think that's where they got the idea from this you know, <laughs> that, for that skit the, the falconer um however uh it's one of these uh clark kent superman things uh when uh night falls uh the swordsman disappears and this woman is just uh there and uh, luckily, that only happens a couple times where he, they're like, what is this? I don't know what's going on. Because it's like, if you've seen this before, it's like, it's too, just so fucking obvious. Mm. It's less of a Clark Kent Superman thing, more of a reluctant druid thing. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Uh, so, yes, the deal is they, they, were, they were lovers and uh, they had a curse placed on them that one would be a hawk by day 
and uh, the other one would be a wolf at night, and the two shall never be human together forever. Or, you know, or the mm. end of the movie, of course. Right. Um, <laughs> or shit, you know? Uh, so uh, they, there's a, a way to, uh, to beat this curse, of course, uh, that uh, there are some days where it's not day uh, mm. just because it's an eclipse. Yeah. Apparently they had never had an eclipse at this point. <laughs> this it, was kind of, it was kind of like a V'ger thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yes, a, a fucking eclipse. Okay. Uh, how is this possible? Like, great. But, you know, they're not all astronomers. You got <laughs> It's understandable. <laughs> well, we'll, get, we'll, get, we'll get that. We'll get into that in the actual review. But uh, So then, uh, but of course, uh, Rutger Hauer wants to just fucking kill the guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he just wants to attack and even comes up with a, a suicide plan in case his attack doesn't work. And uh, which <laughs> yeah. we'll get into that a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they, he confronts him. They have this battle, but then he fi fi finally figures out what an eclipse is. And uh, I guess we'd say hilarity ensues at this point. Yeah. And the, Poppy title music was just oh hideous. Yeah, I felt dirty. Um, I <laughs> yes. did like you know, you know. I thought when I was listening to that, actually, I had to like skip like, <laughs> through the fifteen second skip yeah, yeah. thing during the, the opening credits because right. I was like, this is just too awful. Mm -hmm. But I was just thinking of last week, like, wow, you thought that soundtrack was bad. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, I really only had a problem with the one song, but yeah. Um, I'll take Jimi Hendrix right. on the nose any day over. Yeah, right. You know. no, I'll take the other version of that song before I'll take the title music of this movie. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Dennis DeYoung is the Antichrist. Yes. Um, but once the movie got started, I did appreciate the kind of quick cut to the gallows. They kind of catch you off guard with this quick cut to these you know bodies falling right. from a, ga a, a gallows. Um, it starts a lot darker than I was in expecting. Right. And uh, yeah, I guess it does. It sets an odd mood to it because the rest of the movie really isn't all that dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was a little disappointed. Um, although the music dates it. And then we, oh, they, definitely. they introduce um, Broderick's character, Mouse, Matthew Broderick. Um, and he's just doing his Matthew Broderick thing, um, which was kind of interesting at first. It added some nice comic relief to this otherwise very serious movie. But then it just... Uh, I, just you know what? Got to be I too much. see there is no difference between this character and, and Ferris Bueller. And every other character Matthew Broderick has played. Ferris Bueller has the fourth wall narrative too. Well, yeah, He doesn't really break the fourth wall in this per se. I mean, that's, that's a, right, that's he's a, talking to God. When yeah, that's a thing in Ferris Bueller where he wall. deliberately breaks the fourth wall. Mouse right. never looks at the camera. He's talking to God. So, you know, it could be argued that it's it's a little bit fourth wall breaking, but not in the same way as Ferris Bueller. But, but the accent. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Oh, you know, I mean, he, he was, did not have the accent down. Was he even trying? I didn't. It just sounded like a normal Matthew Broderick thing. I can tell you exactly what happened without reading any trivia or anything behind this. Just from watching the movie last night, uh -huh. the director wanted him to sound a little British. Mm -hmm. He tried in the first scene. Okay, yeah. But then when he actually had to do stuff and like right. talk at the same time and like escape from the prison, it, it it was ridiculous and hard for him, too hard for him to hold on to. Uh -huh. And so after a while. They, they he dropped it and then they had him try to pick it up again in like another scene but he just couldn't hold on to it yeah. and then from there on out he just spoke in you know Biloxi yeah. Blues you know I Neil always Simon. thought Broderick was a pretty damn good actor until watching this and realizing every fucking character <laughs> is the same <laughs> he always plays the same guy <laughs> well this is around this like a year before Ferris Bueller mm -hmm. and this that horrible Godzilla movie, Ferris Bueller, it boxy blues. It's always the same guy. In fact, I would like to see this recut 
with the Ferris Bueller soundtrack. <laughs> yes. Like when, when he's trying to like sneak out, you know, the chick you know. Yeah. <laughs> and of course Mouse gets caught when he's because he decides to mouth off. He finds this little t- village and you know, he goes to a bar and says, you know, I'll buy everyone a drink. Or, or, or drinks around me for the person who wants to, you know, drink with me because I'm I just escaped from the unescapable prison. And, you know, the guard comes up. <laughs> and it, he he, get, he runs away, you know, after Howard saves his life. And it looks like he's walking down a paved road. Like asphalt paved. You know, I didn't notice that. But I mean, it might have been, just been a dirt road, but it looked, it looked like asphalt. Um, I did like the contrast between Broderick and Howard at first. Cause, yeah, you know, Hower is always Hower, of course. Um, yes. And I'm guessing it's set in, well, I don't know where it would be set, because Aquila doesn't sound English. I was, I was thinking France, of course. Well, that would make sense with, you know, Gaston, Philippe Gaston. You're right. Um, but, you know, Hower is doing his normal, you know, very slight Dutch accent, because he yeah. was from the Netherlands. Um, Michelle Pfeiffer wasn't really trying anything. No. <laughs> And that's what you do. If you can't pull the accent yeah, off, right. don't bother with the accent. There's no need for it. Right. And and everybody else was pretty much British. Right, right. They're not going to be speaking English anyway. They're right. gonna, they're, they should be speaking French. Right. But we can forgive that. But, I mean, why have a British accent <laughs> if it's not even in England? Right. I gotta say, the intermittent slow motion was getting on my nerves. Like, every uh, once in a while, they would slow-mo a scene. It was just that cliche 80s thing. Yeah, and and the the cheat for the uh, camera, you know, the, the creature change. Right. Which they obviously did not have the budget to right. do, like, a manimal right. you know, change. <laughs> Thankfully. Um, and when, you know, the wolf suddenly shows up, and then Navarre... Right, Howard's character is gone. You know, when she suddenly shows up and the and the hawk is gone, it's pretty obvious what's happening. Yeah, but they still make you wait like ten minutes before they fully explain it. Right, it's it's another V'ger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thing where you're just like, get on with it. <laughs> and and the, at about half hour in, I was getting tired of of Broderick's you know internal monologue shtick, and I say <laughs> internal in quotes. Also, when when the hawk got shot with the crossbow, the arrow that was sticking in the hawk looked a lot smaller than the arrow that was sticking in Isabeau when she turned back into human. <laughs> yeah, should there be like a, a size adjustment? Like, <laughs> yeah, the arrow grew with her. I don't understand it. I think I did like the bishop's connection to her when it was being pulled out, though. Um, because he's in pain as well. He's like feeling the same pain that she's feeling. You know, the guy who cursed them. Yeah. And of course, you know, he cursed them because he wanted her and she was into Navarre and not him. And so, you know, right. if, if I can't have you, no one can, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, there was a, a sort of a, a thing about toxic masculinity here way before that was even uh, a coined term, isn't there? And, you know, first... It, and well, it's, it's it's the bishop who is the villain, of course. But then there's um, there's Howard. There's Howard. There's also Broderick. There's a scene where you know, because you know he, Howard and, and Pfeiffer's characters kick Isabel and and um, Navarre can't communicate because they they're one 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 is human, one's an animal. Um, Broderick is the go between, and Ma- Mouse. Um, and one scene she. She basically asks, you know, did he? What did he say, you know, before he turned? And he said, "You're to listen to everything I say and do exactly what I tell you." Mouse told this to her, kind of like using her in a weird way, and then he has her dance with him. <laughs> that was just a weird scene. That was weird, but I wouldn't say what. Uh, well, Gaston the other was the was bit a at the toxic end. masculine thing. You know, he, he. I think he stayed hoping to have a shot with her, of course. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, you know, he he was still, uh, he was still a gentleman, actually. Oh yeah, yeah. In, in no, it was just the whole you know, you're to do everything I say bit that that just rubbed me the wrong way. 
I think he was trying to make sure nothing happened to her. Probably Maybe. out of fear yeah. of Nafar. Of, of, yeah, Nafar killing him, yeah. <laughs> yeah right, I okay. Think, um, I think that was a very realistic fear. The, the, the really <laughs> problematic part from Navar came at the end. Or toward well, the end. Well, right. The whole thing of just not listening to anybody like, dude, we have a way for this whole thing to get, oh, yeah. go away. Uh, just ignoring all of that. And then to even mm-hmm. have like a suicide he, he tells um, this this monk who is with them, uh, who is kind of traveling with them, the one who, who had the prophecy of how to, you know, break the curse, that if his plan fails, he the monk is to kill the hawk. And actually, uh, to do it, like, as soon as you hear the yeah, bells, that right. means... As soon as you know I failed, kill her. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and Not it's, like it's... let's let's see what happened first or mm-hmm. anything. No, as soon as this goes to shit, just kill her now. Yeah, what? Another, <laughs> you know, if I can't have her, no one can. Well, pretty much, exactly, exactly. He was no different from the uh, the archbishop. Right. Also, another thing that struck me in this movie is Roderick does not seem comfortable in fantasy fiction. No, no, this is definitely out of his wheelhouse. Yeah. Are you kidding? Um, I mentioned the, the the monk. Imperius is his name. I have it here. Yeah, easily the best part of the movie. Definitely. Well, Howard, I, I, I love yeah, Howard. Howard's always fun, but I I just got a kick out of Imperius. Um, I loved him kind of gar- leading the guards through this booby trapped castle. I mean, they were so close to having an actual you know Dungeons and Dragons party mm-hmm. assembled. You know, the healer, the thief, Thief's, and yeah. the swordsman. Right. And uh, instead, they, they kind of kept them all at a distance from each other. Right. Well, because it wasn't a quest movie. I could have been, though. I mean, the quest was to break the curse. Well, but that didn't really become a... Th- it was kind of... They, they, they brought the party together. Yeah. And then they spent, like, the entire second act trying to convince Howard to go on the quest. <laughs> Right, he had a revenge quest that he wanted to do, and uh, the, I don't understand the point of stealing the sword either. I mean, okay. he just had another sword anyway. <laughs> and, um, right, and they had to convince him that this would work rather yeah. than his revenge quest. And it was pretty obvious from, again, a 2020 standpoint that when when uh, Imperius said, there's a time when it's not day and not night, you know, that... It, they're talking about an eclipse. And even if they didn't have the word, even if they didn't have a scientific understanding of what an eclipse is, <laughs> if it had ever happened before, you would think they, that they would know that it's a thing, and that's what he's talking about. True. Well, I mean, technically, isn't it still daytime when they're an eclipse? <laughs> but it's not light, and they were conflating <laughs> nighttime and daytime and whether it's light or dark. Okay. <laughs> you know, the time of day doesn't actually change. It's just the light level in a particular part of the world that the sun is happens to be facing at that time. But, you know. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure the last time we had that big solar eclipse, I was at work, so I'm pretty sure it was daytime. Right, of course. And, you know, it was light again, like, two minutes later. <laughs> yeah. Although, yeah. Uh, honestly, the eclipses last... A really fucking long time in real life, as opposed to this movie where it was like mm-hmm. two minutes. Oh, it's an eclipse. <laughs> not, not, I'm being facetious when I say two minutes, but they don't last that long. Like maybe five, ten minutes. The ones I've I seen. Mean, it takes forever for a, well, it to travel. Yeah. To reach peak. Right. And then to to. Well, I, I mean, like the fall darkness is like yeah, maybe ten fifteen. Um. But you would think that True. they would know. Right, right. The peak actually only lasts for so long. Yeah. But it takes forever for it to well, get yeah. to that point right, to know right, that right. it's happening. Because giant bodies move very slowly, at least from a distance. <laughs> right. And then to have the perfectly, you know, bashed hole in the stained glass window right, for the right. to be seen through. It's like, oh my God. I <laughs> so mean, 80s. <laughs> I can't complain about conveniences like that because I'm a Star Wars fan and. The original trilogy is built on conveniences. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, also, why would Mouse tell Isabel in human form 
that hawk is his favorite thing to eat. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry, in hawk form. She was in hawk form. And he's talking to her, wondering if she can understand him. And he's saying, like, he used to love to eat hawk. <laughs> that just seems like it is in bad taste. It's like, literally. Um, like, yeah, I, I, I would eat you if it weren't for that guy who's going to kill me if I do. <laughs> Which is kind of what he implies in a different sense in other parts of the movie. <laughs> uh, Did you catch who the uh, the trapper was? Just getting was? to that. Cesar was okay. Alfred Molina. Did not recognize him until I saw the credits. A super young Alfred Molina. Yeah, I went at, back uh, and like, oh yeah, that was him. I was like, that guy looks familiar. <laughs> Did like the uh, Ice Lake Rescue, but the music got way too loud and was just way more intense than the actual scene. <laughs> yes. Like, the music was, like, blasting out the dialogue. It didn't make sense. They they spent so much money on the soundtrack. I mean, to get Alan Parson, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, they had to pay him a ton, probably. I'm just thinking how much Richard Simmons would have loved to have this soundtrack back in the day. <laughs> and the Eclipse... You. Yeah. We could, I mean, not just the soundtrack, we should get the cast of Ferris Bueller, you know, Rooney oh, yeah. to play the Archbishop, <laughs> and Cameron to play uh, Navarre. And when we actually get to the Eclipse, it's just hilariously bad looking. Oh, yeah. And it's not like early bad CG. It was just this, this cutout of the moon that was just way too detailed, <laughs> yes. moving in front of the sun. In this perfect, you know, lineup of the, the pole and the weird mm, It was just, yeah. what were they thinking? I did like the trick that Navarre used to kill Mar Mar Marquette, um, the guard who was chasing him. Um, they end up dueling before he confronts the bishop. And uh, he's, um, uh, Navarre is on the ground kind of rolling out of the way of, of stabs from Marquette's sword. Sword ends up behind him. He just rolls on it. And yes. takes it out of his hand, rolls over it, picks it up, and and put you know, jabs him in the stomach. That that was amazing and uh, and worthy of slow motion too. Yeah, that unlike one. Like a lot of unlike a lot of other shots. If they didn't do that in slow motion, but like, wait a minute, how the fuck did he lose his <laughs> upper hand so quickly? Yeah, yeah. Um, that was the one good use of slow motion. You're right. Um, I did think something bigger and more pyrotechnic was going to happen when the curse was broken. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Rather than just Imperius going, that's ah, done. Because <laughs> they're confronting him. They're both, you know, um, you know, um, Navarre is about to kill him. Isabel walks in. They're both there in human form. Um, it looked like a little bit of a light or something, maybe coming out of them, or I don't know. It looked like um, the bishop was smoking a little bit, and I don't mean smoking a cigarette. It looked like smoke was actually rising from him. Um, <laughs> and and but he just kind of looks and sits there horrified. And, you know, he doesn't, like, turn to stone. There's no pyrotechnics. There's no, you know, light shining from anywhere aside from the hole in the window once the sun comes back. Um, it's just this, it's just Imperius saying, well, that's done. <laughs> it's broken. <laughs> ah, yeah. So much for that. <laughs> and, ah, you know, it was a curse that uh, it had its day at time, you know. <laughs> and just when I'm, I think I'm free of... The pointless romantic subplot. Because, I mean, the romance was the point of the movie. I was going to say, wait a minute. This no, is I'm not complaining about Navarre and, and Isabeau. That's, I have no problem with a romance being front and center in a film. But yeah. at the very end, Mouse and Imperius. You think they had They get a, the kiss they and they walk away holding hands. And I'm, Mouse I'm and kidding. Imperius? Wait a minute. Oh. <laughs> Mouse I, and Imperius were kind of chummy at the end. I thought I snoozed a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> they were kind of chummy at the end. It was weird. Um, yeah. Well, you I'm know, the kidding. two sidekicks. Yeah. Um, sequels and remakes? Sequels and remakes. I actually would like to see a, like, a serious remake of this. Would they better cast any tolerable score? You mentioned Ian Anderson. He's fucking perfect for it. <laughs> of course. Uh, you know, I didn't have that much of a problem with the cast in this, honestly. Um, I mean... I you, didn't... You, I mean, I, I, I like Howard. <laughs> Although, I almost called Broderick Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> cast-wise, the only... say a lot. <laughs> the only real issue I have cast-wise is Matthew Broderick. I, I think the problem lies in the director of this film more than anything else. Um, they, 
did not seem to know what the fuck he was doing. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah, I would like to see a, a better remake with, you know, a, a actor playing Mouse who, you know, doesn't monologue all the time and is comfortable doing fantasy. Um, I'd love I mean, to see Steve Buscemi or, you know, somebody like that, dude, you know. Well, in, in that role, he's too old for it now. Unless you do go older with the thief. Yeah, the thief doesn't have to be a kid. That's true. Um, that would, he'd be perfect. Um, because I could see him in that kind of role. Yeah. Um, I don't know who you'd cast as the big hulking, you know, hero guy. Um, yeah. Vin Diesel. John, John Cena. Diesel would be perfect, actually. Because Diesel can act. Ah, uh, can he? I, I watch the Pitch Black movies. He's actually pretty good. Um, and he, he kind of fits the role. Um, I would love to cast someone from this in the remake, but... Um, there I've are no seen real because he's a bit younger, you know, and he can. Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, I, if, if he can act, yeah. So. Um, like probably just as good as Diesel. <laughs> yeah. we were um, but um, I don't know who. There are no important female characters aside from um, Isabeau, so I don't know. So Michelle Pfeiffer, you wouldn't want to cast in anything. Um, Howard's no longer with us. Bueller's uh, girlfriend's name, but that's who I'd have in my uh, Ferris Bueller remake of this. Well, I mean, if we're doing, I mean, like a serious <laughs> remake. Um, I guess uh, Bueller is uh, uh, Broderick is imperious, maybe, but he would become oh, Magic Max. That would be that would be an, a nice touch to put uh, Broderick in as imperious. He's really the only one who's left. Um, who you could. I just yeah. Uh, is, is it Princess Bride? Is it Magic Max? Oh, I feel like he would do that with the role. Billy Crystal. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it was a very Princess Bride moment of like, ah, oh, you know, you killed mm, the hawk, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess he he would work in that role. Anyway, on the brains. On the brains. Uh, I was kind of at a three, but I had to take it down for the misogyny, and of course, the music took a half a brain. So I'm going to. Um, let's see. I, I'm, I'm going to stick with the three because I mean I liked the cast mostly. Of course, Howard uh, hated the soundtrack, which just absolutely stomped over everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's just very clumsy directing. Yeah. So yeah, but it's still like an enjoyable movie. I thought. I don't know why it would be like a twenty-minute turn-off kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, I think it was maybe I, I checked what was going on at twenty minutes after because I'd read that tweet. Um, it was mostly just the the prison escape. So like I think Hawk he just the Slayer, if I remember right, had like a really weird eighty sound right, synth yeah. soundtrack too. I think what do we call it? Like disco horseback riding, because right, right. like every scene they were riding horseback had this like like synth music. I, I but suspect it, it wasn't nearly as annoying as this was. I, I suspect Bodo was put off by the title theme, the title music, and Matthew Broderick's monologue. You know, if you made it through that title sequence, you might as well stick with the rest of them. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, you paid yeah, your so dues. I'm, so I'm going, I'm going three. Okay, what have we learned? Uh, medieval life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. And I learned that Matthew Broderick should never do a medieval fantasy ever, ever <laughs> again. No. All right, that's it for Lady Hawk. Until next time, we'll be, con- we'll be concluding this trilogy with Labyrinth. Hopefully it's better than the last two. I, you know what? I don't know if I've ever made it through the entire movie of Labyrinth. It was kind of a kid's movie back in the day. And it was kind of like, eh. I know many, many people who will be very mad at me for saying this, but I've never seen it. Yeah, I don't think I've, uh, I've never made it from beginning to end. I've, I've never seen, seen it at all. <laughs> and so then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. <laughs> So we we stopped recording about twenty minutes ago. <laughs> oh, at least. <laughs> and just realized we'd never recorded the Bill and Ted mini review. Um, we we both saw Bill and Ted over the weekend. Um, I fucking loved it. Oh, yes, same here, same here. Um, uh, when when's the last time you've seen the others? Oh, probably shortly after they were in theaters. Because uh, Mrs. Scotto had never seen. Even the first one, which was kind of like a, whoa. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and uh, 
the second one, of course, is kind of kind of an odd duck. The second one, station, station. Uh, I mean, there's like a lot of neat little things that mm-hmm. they throw out it there, yeah. but as a movie uh, as a whole, it a lot of it doesn't really work. They, they had really a lot of ideas that they tried to cram in, and it's very lazily produced, also yeah. uh, directed. But like it introduces the, death. The scene at the end when they're supposed to be playing their final concert right. is like some of the worst pantomiming of <laughs> instrument playing. And this is even in comparison to like MTV days. Yeah. They they totally weren't playing, you know. You Which tell. is surprising because I, I actually was watching that scene, the the post credit scene and and face the music and thinking, I, I wonder if they actually play guitar. Because, I mean, they obviously weren't actually playing the thing. But right. from their hand motions, it looks like they actually play. Then I remembered, yeah, Keanu Reeves plays bass in Dogstar. Um, so probably also plays guitar. And then I was watching an interview. They really bonded. They're actually really close IRL. Um, they bonded over when they went to the audition for the first movie and found out one of the things is they both play bass. <laughs> <laughs> they both drove a motorcycle. They both play bass. Similar taste in theater. Blah blah blah. They really bonded. Um, when you watch the second one and then watch this one, it's like, wow, this is so much better. Mm-hmm. The, there were two parts at the beginning where I knew I was in. When we find out again, this is full spoilers. Um, they named their daughters after each other. Well, they do. They actually they introduce the kids at the end of. Uh... The second one. Oh, they do. Okay, I forgot about that. It, it's a really weird thing at the end because they're they're supposed to play this big concert at the end of the second one, and they're they're all set to go, but they realize they suck. <laughs> <laughs> you never learned how to play instruments. Uh-huh. So what they did was they go back in time to learn to play, right. and then when they come back with their wives and everything. Like he, you know, uh, one's got like a long beard, and the others, you right. know, they both have babies. They introduce them as Bill and Ted. Okay, but yeah, now when now we find out they're actually female versions. Yeah, um, Bill's daughter is Thea. Uh, Ted's daughter is Wilhelmina. Um, and then we get the song they play at the wedding, which is just fucking brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> pulling out every obscure instrument starting with the theremin and theremin and then just pulling out every obscure instrument you can think of it's this amazing like world music prog thing yes, yes. i knew i was i was in when and i saw that too it's like okay this is why they never made it they're damn good musicians but they're playing prog right and that's never going to bring the world together unfortunately <laughs> And then Kristen Schaal is the new Rufus, or be, be, you know, took the place of uh, Rufus. And I love Kristen Schaal, so I do too. I think she's a good choice. I mean, I pro- I would have wouldn't have mind seeing Dave Attell as mm-hmm. as Rufus's yeah. son, but Kristen Schaal works well too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the daughters, particularly Billy, was really just doing an impression, but they did oh, it yeah. so well. They did. They had all the mo- movements down. Yeah. The, when they did, when one of them did like the little head shake. I was like, "Oh my god, mm. that is so perfect!" Um, and then it's it's kind of a dual quest. Um, there is kind of a romantic subplot, but it's saving a marriage. So okay, it's already yeah. an existing relationship. Um, the Bill and Ted are basically off trying to find the song to basically steal from themselves to learn the song <laughs> that's going to save the world. Or save reality in this version. I loved them going through different points of their older life. Mm-hmm. Or lives, sorry. Because, yeah, yeah. I mean, they are, they are pretty much living one life. Yeah. Um, and basic, in one version, they try... The alternate universe versions of Bill and Ted hate the originals because they ended their marriage. Right. And then we get another one who basically try to sell them a Dave, try to not sell them, try to pass off a Dave Grohl song as their own to just kind of get out of it. I mean, he's no Sir James Martin, but right. yeah, I mean, he could accept a cameo from Dave Grohl. Uh-huh. Um, but then the daughters go on the quest to, to put the band together. Yes. Um, Hendrix, great which, impression of Hendrix, great impression which they take, of... It's sort of the first 
you know plot of the first one right. where yeah. we we have a project to finish let's get the best people from history right. to come forward a, and uh, help us out here hendrix they start with hendrix they and they find out well hendrix won't do it but he loves louis, louis armstrong so they get louis armstrong and bring him in and that brings hendrix in and then they get mozart they're watching mozart at you know a, a, playing at, at this you know gathering and hendrix somehow finds an amplifier <laughs> he he's standing standing there with his strat looks around takes a cable has somehow has a guitar cable <laughs> walks behind a thing i don't think it was the pod that they showed up and i think it was just a bit of scenery plugs it in apparently there's an amp there <laughs> I imagine Jimi Hendrix had uh, access to amps wherever he went, yeah, yeah. no matter what. But wherever in time. Um, yeah. The Chinese musician, I want to say Ling Long, um, the inventor of modern or of classical Chinese music, um, actual person, invented the wooden flute. Um, cool. Yeah, uh, that was interesting. And then the drummer, um, Draga, I think, or Drog. I loved how she had a kit. Made out of, like, <laughs> stones. <laughs> like an actual drum kit made out of, like, stones and shit and pots. <laughs> um, and the twist at the end was predictable, but I liked it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you could kind of see that coming from a mile away. It, it wasn't... It was a different Logan in Preston. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and what was his name, the robot? Um, oh, my God. Dennis. He stole Dennis... <laughs> Then it stole the fucking movie. <laughs> you think Death is going to steal it, but then Dennis. I thought it was the same actor, too. When I first saw Dennis, I thought it was the actor. I thought it was William Sadler who played Death. Um, they look quite a bit alike. A.K.A. Sloan from Deep Space Nine. Right. Um, <laughs> but he starts off as this killer robot who the, peop- the, the future um, you know, send out because they don't think Bill and Ted are going to do the job. And... They fail. They, oh, no, the, the robot <clears throat> sends them to hell just as they get the song. <laughs> and so then, really, the robot succeeds. Yeah, but it's it's not. I mean, it's a failure. <laughs> just as they were about to save the world, he kills them, and then yeah. the robot kills himself to give them the song in hell. And <laughs> he goes from this silent killer assassin to this really neurotic kind of just average guy, every man. I mean, kind of taking a little bit of Marvin. Yeah, you know, a little bit of Marvin, yeah. The paranoid android. But it's not even paranoid. It's just kind of, I'm, I, I'm Dennis. Dennis well, Dennis Caleb McCoy, that was it. Right. He, he always introduces his himself with his full name. <laughs> and he just <laughs> talks everybody's ear off. It's, if you remember the, the Animaniacs sketch, the guy at the party who just talked Yakko's ear off. <laughs> He's that guy. <laughs> And it's just this incredibly annoying but endearing character as this robot in the middle of a movie that really has nothing to do with him. Right. They just throw so much at you. I've heard it compared to a lot to Men in Black as well um, because of the way it's cut in the design of the future. I love the first Men in Black, so. Yeah, Yeah, the first Men in Black was not bad. So, I mean, that's a reasonable comparison, and it's fair, and and it's fine. Yeah. Um, but there's nothing, in, nothing unpredictable per se. But it's, it's. I mean, Dennis aside, um, it's very predictable. You knew death was coming back. It's the ending is very predictable. It's just brilliantly done. I loved the behind the music thing with death, though. You know, yeah. the uh, the the stardom just got to him. I mean, they kind of insinuate this at the end of the second one uh-huh. that they have a, a thing against each other right. in headlines. You know, death wins the Indy well, yeah. 500. Because you need the behind the music moment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they kind of played that out with, you know, Death Left the Band, did a bunch of solo albums. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the girls save the day not because they're musicians, but because they listen to a lot of music. And so they can yeah. like, play a little bit of this, play a little bit of that, and kind of direct the band to kind of play bits and pieces of their existing music. And I loved them handing out. In, Bill and Ted kind of double themselves, and you know, fuck with time, so they can hand an instrument to literally everyone in the world. That's always been my favorite part of all three of these movies, 
is how there's no respect for the space time continuum. There's no it's respect for the space time continuum. There's no respect for logic. Right. There's. I've always loved that about this. How it's not like, oh, you can't meet yourself or anything like no. that. No, no. From the very beginning, they were all just like, hey, future Bill and Ted. You know, like the very first one. Well, technically, that's you, the same matter can't exist in the in time at the same place without destroying reality. It's not technically the same matter. Yeah, but you know what? None of that's actually proven because it's well, never it, happened. Because right, it's impossible to prove that because we don't have time travel. <laughs> right, but also they didn't necessarily <laughs> break that rule because every cell in your body replenishes, like within like seven days. Huh. It's not really the same matter. I was thinking about that because I an nitpick science. Thought. So you know, Bill and Ted from another timeline are not the same Bill and Ted physically. Different matter. I don't know how I don't know how far apart they were uh, in the first one where they come back and meet Rufus in the Circle K parking lot. Right, right. It's probably only a few hours, honestly. Yeah. So I don't think that that stands where their cells have been replaced by that much because everything happens in the same day in the first one. But I'm talking about like the the burnt out uh, other versions of Bill and Ted after the marriages have ended. Oh, those, yeah, those are years apart, yeah. yeah those guys have been through some shit. And those are right. the ones they actually, like, shook hands with and touched. Yeah. So that's where that would have been an issue. The other ones they just observed from a distance, so. Um, it has, there would have to be a contact. Um, and they, one of them actually hugged their doppel, their, their other version. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, it was just genius. Um, the other thing I love about Bill and Ted that I forgot about, and the reason I want to go back and visit or revisit them. They're just so hopeful. <laughs> They're just... Bill and Ted are the eternal optimists. Uh, the first one is is really brilliant. Um, <laughs> just the whole uh, Napoleon Bonaparte mm. uh, going to the Waterloo water park. Yeah. <laughs> and just, you know, shoving kids out of the way right, so he right, can get right. on the water slide. And then he comes up with his uh, his strategy to invade Russia. <laughs> and it, and in their history presentation, right. he, he put lays it out there. And, you know, Keanu Reeves is just like looking at it going, I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> and then he just gets angry and smashes hmm. the board. <laughs> Using a risk board, by the way, to demonstrate yeah, his course, strategy. Yeah. But of course, you know when they get to the slow, the song at the end, when you know everybody in the world has an instrument, I of course had to grab my ukulele and figure out the chord changes. <laughs> Play along. Um, Did you see the Weird Al? Uh, I read about the Weird Al um, uh, cameo He's one at of the, the end. Many I didn't see it. Playing at the end, yeah. Because the closing credits there is like a billion screens on the screen of different famous people playing along with the song. But yeah, I missed most of them. Um, there was it was it was Weird Al and somebody else who Weird Al was playing an accordion. The other person was like air guitaring. Um, but yeah, definitely get it get a chance to see it if if you can you know spare the twenty bucks on Amazon. Yeah, my brother in law uh, got it. He's got his movie theater set up, mm -hmm. and so we saw it on the big screen. Yeah, yeah I just watched it on my well, four K you know twenty seven inch Mac. <laughs> All right, so like I said, highly recommend it. Um, talk yes. to you later.